Um, so tell me a little bit about your condition, please, Celine. So it's an autoimmune disease under the umbrella of IBD. So it's um, inflammatory bowel disease. So basically your body, like all other autoimmune diseases, it attacks itself. So it goes too far and starts attacking itself instead of just um, actual disease and things like that. Basically it attacks itself. You end up with um, ulcers in your intestines and bleeding because of that and scarring and things like that. So. Do you want to talk a little bit about that uh, first flare-up and, and diagnosis and all of that? What, what happened? Mm -hmm. So I was, um, how old was I? I was 16, I think. I was 16. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I had, I had been getting, I'd, I'd noticed blood when I went to the toilet, I think was the first thing that started happening. Yeah. I didn't tell anyone that for a while, I remember you being a bit annoyed about that, because I didn't say anything. But I think it's just, when you're 16, it's a bit embarrassing talking about mm. your body, and it's that time you don't want to share as much, and that, especially about your toilet habits and things. So I didn't say anything for a while, and then, I guess because it just progressed, I did say something, um, and I started having urgency needing to go to the toilet really regularly um like yeah i remember making jokes with my friend at the time where it was like oh i got to, you know it's all it's all funny because it's just like i've got to run home blah, blah, blah. but it i guess quickly becomes not funny in that i um sort of went to the doctors and he recommended getting some tests done but i don't really i don't think we ever got the test done that he ordered because they were so far in the future and things just progressed much faster um, or even if they did, I guess they didn't pick up on the disease at the time. But then one night, um, you were working away, so it was just me and mum. And I remember we got one of those like dining for two ten pound things because we, we, I was unwell, didn't really want to do anything. And I remember it being very feeling really. Because, yeah, at this point, I think I'd been going to the toilet a lot, so I was getting tired, I was fatigue was kicking in and that sort of thing, and I remember being sort of aware that something wasn't right. I think it's called malaise, when you know something is wrong, but you don't know what. Like, your body is telling you something's wrong. Because that's one of the symptoms, I guess, before you kind of know what it is. It's this overwhelming sense of something's wrong. And I remember feeling that, but not knowing to the extent of what, that meant um i think then sort of yeah went watched a terrible movie went to bed and then the next day it sort of started kicking off mm. so um so i suppose we should say you're 23 now mm -hmm. um so this is like six years ago isn't yeah. it so it's um, i guess some of it is a bit of a blur and hard to remember yeah. really it's not even the age that makes it hard to remember i think it is the fatigue of it because your body is so all of the energy you do have is going into like a fight against yourself so all of all of your energy is going into attacking itself instead of its normal activity so I was just really really tired and I started not being able to eat because um, I started being sick as well so I, th I lost a lot of weight um, in that period of time because I was ill and that contributes I think to being a bit Mm -hmm. foggy mm -hmm. so obviously I was really tired I was I presume I was hungry but I was in so much pain I don't remember being hungry but I would mm -hmm. have I would there would have been hunger if you know but I wasn't able to feed myself and so yeah that that's probably where the memory I do remember things but I think I probably remember it differently to your mum because you were in a state of like actual consciousness where I was a bit more out of it yeah I suppose we were in a state of increasing um Going from concern to to di downright, you know, f panic really. Mm. Um, I think, it, I suppose, going back, we we think that a few weeks before we seem to remember that you had a a kind of attack of um, gastroenteritis, yeah, yeah, and that um, that made you really poorly. Mm -hmm. But it just seemed like a normal stomach bug, basically, mm -hmm. um, and. I can't remember whether we associated that with it at the time, but um, but yeah, so that that kind of happened a few weeks before, and then you started to have these symptoms with, that we didn't understand. Um, obviously, we went to the doctors, and they didn't seem to panic. They just no. um, 
and thought it was another stomach bug or something and didn't really seem to show any major concern. So, yeah, I guess I guess the annoying thing was it felt it, it drifted for some time, really. Yeah, I think there was a lot of dragging of feet at the beginning in the sense that I had gastroenteritis in September because I know I did because I missed a couple of weeks of school at the very start of the term in year 11. That's the other thing, it was a really important time in my education because I was doing my GCSE. So it was the first big exams you ever do in England. Yeah. Um, that will allow you to go on to your A-levels that you do after that and that, that lead you to be able to apply to university. So it was the first big set of exams that we'd done, really. And um, at the very start of the year, that's when I got gast gastroenteritis, which is just basically a bit more of a nasty stomach bug. Um, people probably remember the Queen getting it after the Jubilee. I think that's what people <laughs> normally say, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I had that, which in a sense has very similar symptoms because it is like sickness and diarrhea and things like that and it is like a horrible bug so then when I got ill again I'm like oh how have I got this again that's really annoying Um went to the doctors so I'm like, I don't you know just take some rest we'll do some tests we'll see what comes up but nothing like major and then yeah I think I think when someone tells you, well, I think when a patient tells you they're bleeding, um, like when they go to the toilet, I feel, I feel like there was a very lack of like urgency to that because I thought when you told a doctor that you were bleeding and you're passing blood, um, when you go to the toilet, that there would be a bit more urgency, but um, I don't. Yeah, I remember there being like this idea of taking some tests in January time, so it was a full month before. I ended up in hospital but I don't remember ever really doing those tests or them leading anywhere or much mm. going on from it which is disappointing yeah so um so yeah I, I was away working um I was supposed to be away for two weeks wasn't I and um and that's when it all kind of kicked off wasn't it so yeah. up until that point um doctors weren't particularly concerned you've been a bit poorly and they'll do some tests but there wasn't any kind of major no. issue but then um when i was away you suddenly seemed to deteriorate really quickly and, and it uh, did seem to happen really fast at one point like i feel like it seems fast but it's just i was able to cope until that point do you know what i mean yeah. so like it was it did deteriorate over the period of a month but then all of a sudden there was a point where like i just couldn't anymore it's like do, do you know what i mean so it's like yeah. it probably it feels a lot like one it feels like in my memory that night like i said we were having that t like tv dinner and then i woke up the next day and it was just like no more can't do it um but it was a slow decline i guess into that point but it feels really in my memory mm. like it feels like there was a shift at a point mm. so i don't know i mean the, d the disease probably did get more aggressive at that point um I was at home ill for a few days because I think we just tried to ride it out a bit because you do just presume it's going to be another bug. Um, we just thought, okay, well, doctor said it's fine. So I tried to ride it out for a bit and then I was very adamant. I think I was more adamant that I didn't want it to be a serious thing. So I was just like, oh, that's fine. Blah, blah, blah. And then mum kind of put her foot down and said, no, we need to go to A&E. So the doctor's not doing anything at the, the, the general practice. So we're going to go to A&E because at this point I'd not eaten for a while I'd not because every time I ate I was sick um, so any accident and emergency so this yeah. is like the emergency room like ER because I was still able to walk at this point so I walked into A&E myself and everything and um, you know sat in the queue obviously uncomfortable I was in pain and I was having to go to the toilet a lot but it wasn't like unbearable it was still there had been a shift it had obviously gotten worse I couldn't go to school, but I was, I was okay, um, but obviously not really. Uh, like in my mm. head, I was mm. like, I'm okay. Mm. So then we went into the hospital. Um, I think they took some blood tests and things, and my blood count was going low. My iron was, my iron stores were depleting and things like that. So the, the concern was now being had because I was losing considerable amount of blood. Um, at this point, I think Mum actually saw the toilet, the toilet, and saw the blood, and that was the final straw as well. After the conversation with you and that sort of thing, it was like no, no, no. Hmm. 
because yeah I don't I, I must have just been I just I was in such denial I really didn't want to be poorly I didn't want to be sick didn't want it so um it took someone else I guess seeing it and be like, no so we went anyway got into this and you know the kind of like a and E hospital wards that just everybody that's got something wrong is just in that bit until they just, mm -hmm. until they roll you somewhere else so um the woman this nurse took me and a lot of the nurses are really lovely but i do remember this much and it, the thing is it it's really colored by your emotions at the time so but like so i'm not a problem with her necessarily mm. but i just remember her like giving me a gown and being like pop the gown on and then get in the bed and i was just like no 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 <laughs> i don't i don't because the idea of putting on the gown was like oh no i'm in hospital now a patient at the hospital so I just started like crying at that point because it was all getting a bit scary even though all she was doing was just being like oh here's a gown to mm. wear but to me it just because she just kind of gave that to me and then walked off and like closed the curtains I was like get changed and all of a sudden life was different because mm. <laughs> mm. now it was like okay we're treating something we don't know what it is we've got to yeah. diagnose this thing and it was really scary because mm. when you're 16 mm. um, someone just coming in being like yeah I think that's the thing to keep bringing back is is that you were so young mm. but you were 16 is a hard age anyway isn't it because you're you're kind of you're almost an adult so you you're treated a lot like an adult mm. but um but on the other hand you, you're still very inexperienced about yeah. anything in fact that was one of the things that was a continual difficulty for Being you 16. wasn't it being 16 because <laughs> they didn't know whether to put you in the in the, the children's mm. ward or in the adult ward? No, and there wasn't room in the gastroenterology department, so that's where you go if you have issues like with your digestive, so intestine, stomach, all of that. There wasn't any room in that ward, so I was in the surgical ward, um, which was nice because I actually got my own room just because in surgical it's normally high risk, so you're in separate rooms. But it was also kind of scary because um, it's high risk, so every night you go to bed to the sound of like I think I heard people passing away and like you know scurrying mm. of that, you know hearing the beeps mm -hmm. and everyone rushing around and that sort of thing. That was quite scary, especially when you've you're sixteen. Obviously, you've stayed around friends and been away from home for a few nights at a time, but never yeah, yeah. that alone. Yeah, because being in it was nice having your own room because you've got your own space, but then you're very alone and you're ill and you're on your own. Mm. so when you're like when mum had to leave at the end mm. of the day because she's got to go home you know yeah they didn't have a, a another bed for mum to sleep in did no, they and, no. which they might have done if you'd have gone to the children's ward so mm. um it was a toss up what was the best really i uh, think it was probably a good idea retrospectively because in the children's ward it is chill, like from the age of like babies and yeah the, well, a lot like, noisier yeah. i suppose and like, yeah so yeah. Mm. you know a lot like younger teenagers and that sort of thing mm. so it was better, but mm. obviously there's like downsides to it as well. Yeah. Because all of a sudden you're just all alone in this room. Yeah. And you're poorly in a frame. With something that you don't know what no, it is. No, because it still wasn't diagnosed at that point. Yeah, so that's something I wanted to talk to you about, was one of the things that was most worrying for, for me, I'm sure your mum, um, as well, was this not knowing. So, mm. of course, when you don't know what the problem is, your your mind runs away and you're wondering you know is it is it something really serious well, is yeah. it cancer is it life threatening um i think bowel cancer was thrown up as a potential because yeah. when there's bleeding then yeah. they they go to bowel cancer yeah. as an option i mean that's the reason that i was frustrated with the doctors is that if there's if there's um as they quote it back passage bleeding then it needs to be looked at immediately because it could be cancer yeah. but it wasn't I was a bit out of it. I think you guys were more concerned. Yeah. Because that, we thought that's what if we've just been sitting here being like, oh, it's fine. And that was what was going on. Yeah, I, I just remember just being, my stomach just wound up constantly. Um, now, I, I did have to go back to, to work yeah. for that week. So I had to go back to the Isle of Wight, um, which was a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I had to because I, I had my own business and that was, you know, had the way we could money. earn a living. Um, so I went back to do that um, that that week. Um, but all that time, obviously, we're w wondering what is what is the problem. So let's fast forward a little bit. So you spent quite some time in hospital. How many weeks um, before we found out what it was? I think it was a week before they did the test that 
um, found out what it was and then it was a, I stayed for a week afterwards because we needed the steroids the, the treatment to work a bit before they let me go right because like I went in hospital once they sent me home they said well, come back for your test be an outpatient things got so bad that I couldn't walk anymore like fatigue wise like I was so I was so lacking in blood and iron and tired and I couldn't eat so mum took me again in or uh, grandma and granddad took us I think in the car um and mum had to like hoist me over like put my arm around her shoulder because I couldn't walk on my own anymore yeah so that's when I then stayed in hospital for a week they finally did the tests because mum had to push for it because it was like weeks and weeks away that they'd scheduled this test and she was like how what are we going to do mm. You know, you can't send her home, she can't eat, she can't walk anymore. Because there was talk about them sending you home, yeah. wasn't there? And I remember your mum saying, no, that is no, not no, going to happen. No, no, she refused it. It was, yeah. the, the thing, it was at a point where I couldn't, I couldn't walk to the toilet anymore, which was probably three feet away. Yeah. Like, I had to, I had to crawl to the toilet. It had gotten that bad and they wanted to send me home. So mum was like, no, there's no chance. And no. also we're not waiting this long for this test. No. Because until that test is done, there can't be any treatment. So there's times when mum just gets... Um, she's um, Your mum is very... She's one of the nicest people I know. She's she's very mild-mannered. But um, there's now and again where she, she gets... Um, Stern. Gets yeah, gets uh, <laughs> what what was it, the guy out of Lord of the Rings? Oh, her Gandalf. Her moment. Gandalf moments where mm. she just kind of she rises a few feet higher and just just stamps her foot and says no, yeah, yeah. that's not going to happen and and that's um, that's kind of what she did and and mm. she she went and found one of the doctors, didn't she? she well, yeah, went because I for wasn't it. on the right ward. That yeah. was part of the problem, I think. That's why they kept pushing it back and be like, oh yeah, we'll do it in like a few weeks, go home. Because I wasn't on the right ward and I wasn't seeing the doctor. Like all the other patients with what I had were with the doctor and would see him every day. I think I saw him once in the two weeks stay in because he on his rounds he didn't always get round to me because I was like in an entirely other place yeah so mum went and found him and she said this can't go on she's really really sick and we don't know what's wrong yet yeah so um so when we finally got the um diagnosis when you got the diagnosis um what did you understand I suppose you know what is IBD and what is ulcerative colitis what did they tell you I don't this is my other thing is that I don't really think that aftercare of being told you've got an incurable illness is particularly wonderful um, in the sense that like they're like you have this yay it's not cancer so that's kind of like because do you know yeah. what I mean so they're oh, like, absolutely, yeah. so they're like well, everyone's really really relieved that it's not cancer but then mm. it's like but now what because you still do have a disease and it, it is a lifelong thing because we don't have a cure for it we have treatment it's an it's an incurable disease, so you know we are. I do have to live with it, but then and, and I do have to like you know come to cope with it. But there wasn't really much discussion of that. It's just kind of like it will come back. It will come back at some point. It will go dormant for a bit. It will come back. Life will be different. You might have to eat different. Right, so you've got this diagnosis, um, we all now know it's called ulcerative colitis, um, we know it's kind of similar to Crohn's disease. It's in the same family, they're yep. both forms of IBD. Okay, so um, um, inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. and you're, you're coming home, so we're obviously really happy about that and mm -hmm. um, we, we we're pleased that you're starting to eat something now. You're, you're able to keep a little bit down. You've lost a lot of weight, mm. so you look quite thin, very thin. Um, but at least you're you're not you've not got the yeah. symptoms that you had. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the symptoms were like it's the, the steroids worked really really well. The thing is, obviously, like there's no guarantee that next time the steroids would work as well for me because they worked impeccably well that time. Like everything, as soon as I started taking the steroids. I think it was like I had IV steroid for a bit, you know, like in the bag, and then I started taking eight steroid pills a day, and that worked incredibly well, because obviously the thing is they are treatments, not cures. So there's no yeah. guarantee that any of the things they know will work. There's different things that they can try. There are other things, um, so hopefully next time, I mean, they'll start with steroids, and then if not, then they'll mm. try something else. But so, so what? What it? 
um, what happens with it? There's flare-ups. Do you want to talk a little bit about... Um, yeah, so it kind of goes... It's a chronic condition, so... I think it's always there, so I do experience pain periodically. Um, I think, like, at least... Every day I'll feel experience some form of pain, but not, like, excruciating. Um, like, stabbing pain in my side and stuff. Like, where you're intestines are I've experienced pain but um I don't and I do use the toilet more frequently than I did before but sometimes it flares up which means it gets worse so it, it's in like full force I guess so um you know ulcers will form again and bleeding will happen again and things like that and if it gets to a point where it's unmanageable then you need to go to the doctors and they need to help you with more than just your daily medication. So you're on regular um, medication? I take something called mesalazine which is um, an, it's an anti-inflammatory so that is basically just to try and stop it from inflaming. There's no guarantee that it will but it, it hopefully will stop it inflaming but if it does then we've got steroids and we've got I think afliximab and things like that to try. Okay um, and that was six years ago when you had that um, first flare-up. Now some people um, have it um, come back quite mm -hmm. regularly. You've managed to um, sort of manage this condition pretty well. Is that, is that yeah? Fair? I think so. The thing is, it's difficult to attribute why I've not had another flare up because we don't understand the disease very well. So it could just be that I'm lucky currently, and then and some pe some people do go really long periods. So they go like ten years without a flare up, and then they have another really bad one. So yeah, some people will experience long periods of remission and then bouts of really bad flare-ups and then some people just have like a continuous state where it's just like it's worse than my normal state but they never have like a really bad flare-up like everybody's experience of colitis is really really different mm. so that's the difficult thing of talking yeah. about it i guess okay and so long term what's the prognosis what what can you expect in the future i guess there's all sorts of scenarios yeah but... i mean I think it would be incredibly lucky if I never had a flare-up again, so I expect at some point to have an, another flare-up. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I, I expect it. Because um, I don't I don't think there's any history of anyone having one flare-up and then being on their merry way and it being okay. Do you know what I mean? So I think yeah. at some point it's going to happen again. And I just have to make my peace with that, because otherwise, you know, be really unhappy. So I've just accepted that at some point it's going to happen again. I don't know when. And I've just got to hope that they can the doctors can, you know, stop it mm. before it gets to a point where the only... So there's medications and there's ways of trying to fix it and return your intestines to their normal state. If it goes too far and there's nothing they can do, it could obviously be life-threatening. So they would have to... They would emergency remove your colon. Is like the final sort of last resort solution because it's better to have a stoma bag than it is to you know basically bleed to death because that's sure what would happen yeah and um, if you can't eat you bleeding constantly i mean your body's destroying itself because hmm. it can attack start attacking other organs within the tract and things okay. so i think someone said when they had their intestine removed they had their gallbladder removed as well because the disease had started to affect other areas right. so obviously like yeah. It's kind of worst case, I guess. That's, yeah, yeah. But I mean, a lot of people that do go opt for that end up being... Not loads of people have emergency ones. I think a lot of people have ones where um, their quality of life is dramatically reduced on a day-to-day -day basis. So they opt for a colon removal. Um, I think it's less common for people to have a really bad flare-up that results in an emergency surgery right. but right. that is something that could happen i suppose right. like if the medications all fail and none of them re you know restore you to a um dormant state then they would remove it but i think it's when people they can't leave their homes because of like needing to go to the toilet or they're so fatigued all the time because yeah. their body is co isn't it never goes dormant yeah so they decide to actively make the decision like book an appointment to have that surgery yes. Um, so what about um, diets? So uh, there's a lot talked about diet. So tell me a bit about your diet regime. Yeah, so um, I'm a pescatarian, so I don't eat meat. So that is. So is that because of the 
colitis or see i just feel a bit guilty eating meat but also i think it is helpful in the sense that meat is harder to digest so when you have a flare-up they do recommend against red meat and pork and that sort of thing i think they're all right about chicken but no skin and things like that but um i think it's just it, when you are in a flare-up they it's hard to digest so you kind of the diet of a flare-up is really weird because it's basically like white rice white pasta no no brown wholemeal you know stuff it's all of the stodge so not even like the good stuff like the green well, you no, think no, no, greens no. are good for you but no. you're not allowed to have greens. no because greens are hard to digest so, so no cabbage yeah. and no cruciferous sprouts. vegetables they're all gone so yeah because broccoli i even now, broccoli is harder to digest, so I don't eat loads of broccoli because I get I get tummy pain when I eat broccoli, which is so stupid. <laughs> but yeah, I get like if I eat too much broccoli because I like to eat a lot of vegetables when I have my meals, so I try and eat a lot more like root veg, like carrots and um, parsnips and stuff. Because mm. if I eat like if I ate the same amount of broccoli as I do carrot, I think I'd be in a lot of pain because the digestion is really what, hard. What about fruit? Fruit, I think I'd chill with fruit. I'm chill with fruit. I think one time I had a bit of like reaction to apples, but then that seemed to go away. So it's just like you have to just sort of mm. wait and see, because the thing is you don't always know if it's directly resulted in. So some people keep a food diary, because you can then see if you always have a reaction based on a particular food. Yeah. Um, because for a while, yeah, I started reacting to apples a bit, but then it seems to have gone. So it could have just mm. been, it coincided with that. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. you know, you have to work that out. It's tricky. Yeah. It's, it's, it's dangerous to jump to conclusions, isn't it? You could end up with a really, really restricted mm. diet because you were like, I flared up with this one time. Yeah. But it's not always necessarily that because you might have just flared up anyway. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. if you are really sensitive, it's probably good to keep a food diary. Um, I, I need to keep carbs in the diet because food moves... When you have colitis, food moves through you faster. Okay. So I think I need the carbs to kind of stodge things up a bit, <laughs> stop it from leaving too fast. So yeah, it's kind of like certain, was it kind of like um, received wisdom that everyone's like, oh, that's, that's what you should do is not necessarily right. Yeah, yeah, your your body works differently, doesn't it? Your mm. digestive system um, is is different, perhaps, to the general advice that yeah. others would get. Yeah, like I don't think I don't think keto. I think keto would be like a nightmare for my system. Yeah. I think all of the fat that you because you eat a lot more fat in keto and you don't eat carbs. I think that would be a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, we should say we, we're not experts in in no. this area, so no. it's just from some sort no, of personal when experience. They, but... When you talk to the dietitian about colitis, mm. they basically say you're going to have to work it out because there's no. Yeah. Um, other than when you're in a flare up, mm. every, you all get recommended the same thing in regards to that. But when your day to day life everyone reacts so differently that they yeah. can't give you a it is a it is ultimately you're going to have to work out what triggers you and what doesn't yeah um so what about things like alcohol um do you are you able to to have alcoholic drinks or yeah that's fine i mean obviously if you have too much to drink then the same as everybody else you know you're mm. going to use the toilet more the next day mm. <laughs> like that's just you know that's just yeah. i think that that's i don't think that's a unique thing to colitis because i think a lot of people say that is a reaction of the body but you're you're pretty um, restrained, aren't you, with your use of alcohol? I don't know? like binge drink really. Mm. No. Uh, um, also, I think you know in uni you have a few more drinks and you have you have a bit of fun. But like, you know, I've never I've never been like so unwell and mm. like yeah can manage myself. Yeah, uh, I think that was one of the things that was going back to when it first flared up. Um, it just felt so unjust, didn't I it? I felt really annoyed. I was really, really annoyed at my body because it had betrayed me. <laughs> I worked really, really hard. Like, um, like I said, because I was sixteen, and I was a little goody two shoes. I'd never drank anything. I didn't smoke. Like, I'd started working out at the gym and things like that because we joined. Me and Mum had joined the gym, so I was like, you know, well. So do you then, you know what I mean? Like you work really, really hard and it you seems behave. so unjust. Yeah, well that's the thing. And all your friends are drinking too much. Well, and... Yeah, like I had lots of friends that like went like there's called it used to be a thing, I don't think anyone talks about it now. Like even a few years 
below us didn't really know what we're talking about but um nappy nights at clubs where like, like nightclubs yeah yeah when nightclubs do yeah. nights for the young kids they're like oh there's no alcohol but i mean everyone's got a hip flask of alcohol so. <laughs> but like i didn't go to any of that no i didn't do i, mm. I didn't go to the park with bottom mm. wicked <laughs> <laughs> i know yeah. it seems so unfair but you know but life is unfair, I guess. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, so let, let's think about... Um, yeah, so w- one of the other things, uh, I guess, that we, we should talk about briefly is um, when we've discussed it before, you've talked about how it's kind of one of those invisible... Um, yeah. Is it a disability? I don't know. But it, it, it's, a, it's a condition that other people can't see, but it does have some impact upon you. Mm. Um, and it's also you feel that it's kind of not necessarily the first thing you want to talk to people about about yourself so do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah so obviously it is an invisible illness so like just looking at me you wouldn't know and yeah. um and the other thing is as well because like i'm within I'm, I'm within a healthy weight spectrum so a lot of people expect you to be quite skinny um yeah because i think more people seem to have more knowledge of crohn's than they do colitis i mm. think with crohn's people do typically end up being um because it affects the whole digestive tract from your throat all the way down so they often you have people that are really really thin but it's not all people um yeah but it's just what they've seen i guess but so like i don't know because like i have lost a bit of weight from working out and eating healthier whatever that means for me and um but before that i think people were like oh you don't look ill it's like yeah i'm not like what is ill do you know what i mean like i always mm. have it but sometimes do you know what i mean hmm. so illness for you means um what? what what you don't look ill you have a condition mm. it's not always flared up but it it sometimes causes you pain yeah. what it's... are the other practical um things that you have to think about like i said like um the problem with the the disease i think is like because we did a course at uni called um, about the body and people's reaction and that sort of thing and we talked about the abject and the abject is things like that make like the body's uh, things that leave the body's boundaries people don't like so like going to the toilet and being sick and blood and people don't like that because it's stuff that should be in being out it's the kind of okay theory of it so it's like a psychological yeah um distaste for yeah for bodily fluids yeah. that end up outside of yeah. you. Yeah, so what was once in being out is gross, basically. Yeah. So, um, for instance, the lecturer in this class, when she was explaining it, said she had a glass of water and she asked someone to come up and drink the water and then spit the water into the cup and then drink it again. So it's her own... Yeah. It's like, it's water that's been in her mouth, but everyone's like, oh, gross. Yeah. So it's that kind of reaction, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, literally seconds before... It was okay. Yeah. Now it's um, now something it's that's distasteful. Yeah, yeah. because it's been in her <clears> mouth <throat> and then not annoying. So relate this to to your condition then. So, with me, it's kind of like one of the symptoms is yeah blood, which people don't like, and then um, having to go to the toilet a lot because of having diarrhea. So people, it's not like and ulcers, which is pus. So it's all of these things that are like abject things that people don't like, um, and. So, for instance, when people think, when I want people to know that colitis isn't actually like easy to live with, and it can be difficult and painful and you know serious. But in order to explain that, I'd have to explain why, and that would mean saying, well, because I have I I get diarrhea and sometimes there's blood in it and there's pus and you know that's not fun conversation and people's faces as you tell them that is not fun you know (laughs) so whenever somebody says you know it's a kind of typical british thing you know you're right how are you and you go yeah fine um if you were to say well actually i've got a bit of a flare-up today Mm. uh, what's that then you have to explain all of those things and i don't want to normally it dies very quickly the conversation though yeah yeah because people are uncomfortable and it's a bit icky do you know what I mean? Like, you just see their face go from... And also, then, they just feel sad for you. And yeah. And pity, and that's, like... Oh. Would you say most people are quite um, sympathetic or or dismissive, or what, what would you I think say? most people are, as an adult. Obviously, when I was at school, it was a bit... Because I came back to school, and then there was a lot of, like... 
I had to have like a toilet card that was like Selena's allowed to use the toilet whenever she needs it's like oh, fantastic <laughs> that's just what you want as a kid yeah like, <laughs> when, when you go because that's the thing like, it would be great if the teachers instead of having a toilet card could just know because I'll mm. you know in the class like if I ask to go to the toilet they have to say yes instead of being like no, you can't, and then being like, hang on a minute, and then presenting my toilet card and being like, I'm allowed. So did you actually ever have to wield said toilet card? I think so, yeah. Okay. I think in, like, a certain teacher's I would have class. loved that. Have the power oh, no. of the toilet. No, because then it's like, <laughs> Excuse oh. me. <laughs> I think you're fine. No, because, no, but it's like, well, that's fine in the moment. Then you come back and yeah. everyone's like, oh, you had to get good toilet card. Why is that? Oh, you're going to, like, crap your pants. <laughs> like... <laughs> Fair Fantastic. Fair <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It would have been easier if they just knew and it could have been like a chill, quiet yeah. thing because kids are horrible. Yeah, yeah. It's the worst place to be, isn't it? If yeah. you have a condition. And like then it. they had like the worst thing where the toilet was an open setup in the sense that, like, yeah, there were cubicles, but there wasn't like a main wall and door. So it's just like, oh, fantastic. So I'd normally get Maria to come with me and turn on the hand dryer so I could just be like left alone. Okay. All right. Um, right. Well, uh, is there anything that we haven't covered? Like I said, the whole you get told you've got a disease and then you packed off home. It's like that. I was quite traumatized after that experience in yeah. hospital, and yeah. um, we didn't really. There was no there offer was... of counselling, no. no psychological support, no. was there? Because all of a sudden your entire world has changed. Because mm. I was the one that would never got ill. I'd never taken a day off of school before that gastroenteritis and gastroenteritis bite, blight, whatever. I, I'd never I'd never been off school ill, so I, I was not someone that got sick and then mm. all of a sudden I mm. had a disease and there was no sort of like, it was all very perfunctory, like, oh, you've got a diagnosis, now time to go home and take your pills and put on some weight and go back to school. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay then. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's interesting. So a little bit of support, um, sort of psychological support, counselling, um, just something to help you kind of mentally cope with this chronic disease you've now yeah. going to have for the rest of your yeah. life, which is quite a daunting thought yeah. when you're 16. Yeah, <laughs> and there wasn't any of that. And Because yeah. the thing is, like, I was then afraid of, I was really, I would get really, really anxious and, like, scared going for checkups because that was the place where everything happened. So it was really, I got really, really nervous every time I had to go back to the hospital for the checkups. Right, and I, and I, I guess being nervous and anxious is not something you want if you've got a bowel no, disease. No, it's literally the opposite of what they tell you to do. They're like, now be nice and calm. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah. sure. So you've been um, back for a checkup fairly recently, um, mm. and they had some not so great news for you. Yeah, well, because I'd not had any major flare-ups, I was hoping they were like, oh, it's just... Um, it's just colitis of like the rectum, so it's only, it's only this tiny bit, yay. But because um, because that's what he suggested to me, which is a, m a mistake. He shouldn't have said that. I mean, just working in retail, we never tell people like, oh yeah, it's probably not accidental damage. <laughs> like, and then it comes in, it's accidental damage. Do you know what I mean? So it was one of those yeah. like, oh, it's probably just in the rectum. Ah, no joke. It's pan, which means it's the entire colon. So it's pan colitis. Yeah. So that basically means like from from rectum all the way down to the end it is all diseased so it, it spreads that far yeah. so obviously that's why it was really bad flare-up because the disease affected the whole thing because the scarring goes the whole way around so that's how they know um because they couldn't go the whole way around when they checked because i was in so much pain and bleeding they couldn't go so when they did their initial mm -hmm. um investigation yeah. they couldn't send yeah. the camera all the way around no. the colon because of the swelling but yeah. now they could and they, they saw that it was um the whole way the whole way okay. which is not what we were expecting and no. it's actually the worst diagnosis i suppose because it does mean if it does flare up again and if they did need to if we if i ever had to make that choice of colon removal it would be the whole colon because the whole thing is diseased it's yeah. not just taking mm. out the portion that is diseased mm. and then reconnecting mm. it's taking the whole thing so that was obviously a sad outcome. Mm. So it's it's a disease that's been around for um, I don't know a few decades. We've known about it, I guess. Um, are there any treatments or the, uh, is there any sign that we'll be able to find a cure or find a way of treating it for good? What what's the? Is there any sort of 
Anything on the horizon? I don't know. There's always potential, isn't there? But I try not to, like, think about that so much because otherwise I think you could spend a lot of your time just, like, looking for a cure and waiting and reading the news about it all the time. But the reality is this is just life, so I'm just going to kind of try and cope with it. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Just get on with your life yeah. and, and If, if one it. day someone offers something, then great, but I'm not going to yeah. spend my life looking yeah. for a cure. Mm. Um. And, like, these things are things that I've had to, like I said, because there wasn't any counselling. I've come to terms with these and made these decisions to think like this in my own because I wasn't given... You've worked through it, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't given help, so... And, like I said, when I went for that checkup where they finally decided, found out that it was pan ulcerative colitis, I, I really started having a bit of a panic <laughs> in the middle of the thing, and I'm like, what's wrong? Is it you in pain? And I was like, no, no, just keep going, like, crying, and you know, trying to breathe and stuff, because I was just, because it was that moment again, that moment I'd not been in that space and experienced that since it had happened, you know, having that procedure since they diagnosed me with it, and I'd mm. not had anyone to help me kind of mentally go through that, and I kind of just disassociated from it instead of dealing with it, I just kind of was like, Ooh. Mm. <laughs> so then just started panicking a bit, and then, yeah, I guess that's when I kind of work through it a bit more but yeah okay all right well um thank you very much for telling us all about that um i i guess um we'll probably put on the um i don't know if there's any groups or anything that people should contact if they, if they yeah they there's the Crohn's and colitis sort of um page they've got their own sort of charity group so and we'll put some links on yeah. there yeah and i think there's um you can do Crohn's and colitis walks and runs but normally their walks because people are really fatigued with colitis so because mm. <laughs> you mm. can do it to raise money for the charity and okay. stuff for research but yeah good thank you very much thanks for talking about it